All right, let's get started. We really got to finish this up so you can work on your your papers. I forget when they're due, but it's I think it's like the week of Thanksgiving, so I kind of mess up your Thanksgiving. But you got it essentially written, don't you? Just sitting in class, so you're almost there anyway. 1123. I don't know about that date. I think that's the day before Thanksgiving. I'll probably, you know, it's one of those things I'll officially make it to 23rd, but if you're a few days late, it's not going to be a big deal. Just hopefully I can get a few early so I can get them. This is a tough paper to grade. Boy, oh, my word. This is one of the paper that takes me over 30 minutes to grade each paper, and there's like 40 students in this class. So that's 20 hours plus of grading. So I like to spread it over several days. All right, so a few close-up issues. We are getting very close to the bottom here. Consumerism. Um, it's higher deductibles. It's getting more money out of the pockets of the, of the consumer versus paying premiums. Why is that important? But because the healthcare sector doesn't perform like a normal competitive industry. There's huge differences in prices. So the cost of a brain scan can range from 264 to 3271. But many other governments do not even ask patients their opinion. German doctors and hospitals have fought efforts of linked funding with quality Cost of the patient reviews, dismiss opportunities. Patients who hold doctors accountable make them better and more efficient. So this is an industry that doesn't like consumers, stupid consumers. You know, we don't know what we're doing. We don't, we're not experts. They don't want us giving ratings on doctors and those types of things. I'll show you some research that shows that that stuff actually is, is quite useful. Um, it's the incentives are wrong, rent sinking, middlemen are being shaken up by firms that target patients directly, which is increasingly online and give them more control on how they access care. Unlisted healthcare startups valued at more than a billion. So there's more and more trying it. You know, at the time this article was written, a lot of this, um, you're not seeing it yet, but hopefully we'll start seeing more of these. You're starting to see firms like Apple and Costco and Amazon, even Alphabet getting into the healthcare industry, mainly because there's so many billions or trillions of dollars being spent, it's extremely inefficient. People say, hey, give me give me 50 billion of that and I'll get something out of it. Um, wearables, how many of y'all have wearables in here? Is that pretty common? Do they work? They, they make you exercise more or you, like, they irritate you if you don't or no? I haven't tried that yet. I, I, have, I have everything on my Excel spreadsheet that keeps me going. Telemedicine firms, Wider range of services. Another more sophisticated area experiencing rapid growth is at home diagnostics. I did that for my, I did a COVID test at home, came back negative. A big reason why it's taking so long for consumer technology to disrupt healthcare is that it's highly regulated. Often, one strategy is to offer general wellness products, products which evade the scrutiny of the regulators. Um, and they only go to professionals on you know, certain points. Thriva, you know, again, for your 10%, you might find one of these firms and see what they're doing and see if it's really, really going to change the consumer side. It's blood tests offer insights rather than official diagnosis. Um, you know, is that going to be an issue for Apple and some of these other firms? Or they going to people start saying, hey, you're not doctors, and they start getting sued because they tell people, hey, your blood, your your pulse is fine, and really they're having a heart attack. I don't know. We'll, we'll see if they're... Software me messes up. Scott Melville with Consumer Healthcare Products Association. There is no going back on the old paternalistic system where you rely on exclusive medical professionals for your healthcare. We'll see if that's the case or not. Values should always be defined around the customer. So this is a Porter's type of, of view. This one's even mentions Porter. In a well-functioning healthcare system, the creation of value for patients to determine the rewards for all the, I love that phrase. So 
So part of your porters, you could pull from this article if you like. The very last thing on porters, which is you know quite a few points. Four points, so it's probably the highest rated one there. You could certainly pull some, some quotes from this article on homepage 98. That's, that, this is worded pretty well. Grace and evaluate for patients should determine the rewards, rewards for other actors in the system. Since value depends on results, not inputs, value in healthcare is measured by outcomes achieved, not the volume of service delivered. So yeah, that's, that's a really great, great quote. <laughs> I didn't highlight much in this article because it's a little bit redundant with Michael Porter. The current organizational structure information systems of healthcare delivery make it challenging to measure and the value. Thus, most providers fail to do so. Providers tend to measure only what they directly control and what is easily measured rather than what matters for outcomes. And, and I don't think there's an easy solution for that. We're talking about stuff that can be somewhat subjective and hard to, hard to measure, but we should at least try. Right. Measuring healthcare to improve healthcare governments need to use the right data. This is an old article, but it's still true today. After removal of a cancerous prostate gland is 76%, but at the best clinics, it's 17%. Um, so, so, you know, these, uh, you know, we talked about what's in the best interest of the patient. You saw that one guy at the end. He said, yeah, my life changed. Who knows what it was? if it was impotence or if you had to go to adult diapers, but which doctor do you think he would have rather gone to? The one that has a 76% dysfunction or the one that has 17%, 43% or 9%? How many patients know that number when they go in to get operated on? Probably none of them. But what if your dad says, I have to go in for prostate cancer, would you, would you give him this article? So you need to you need to check and see which doctor you're you're doing using. Doctors and ministries have long argued that tracking patients after treatment would be too difficult and costly and unfair for providers, along with particularly unhealthy patients. So yeah, doctors and hospitals say blame the patient. Hey, if they're not doing well because they're not exercising, not eating right, we don't have no responsibility for that. And Porter's saying, yeah, you do have responsibility for that. Some clinics have started to track less obvious, obvious variables, such as how soon after surgery they go back to work. By thinking about what matters to patients, providers can provide care and lower costs at the same time. We've seen that multiple times. Um, okay, mobile gadgets. So I'm, I'm gonna skip through this one, but this is part of the, the tech to reduce costs. You could even say it's part of the incentives to live more healthy. So, yeah. wireless West monitors for blood pressure sends data wirelessly to an app and a smartphone, which gives readings to his doctor. Here's another company you could research. I don't know how they got the eye health. I was asking someone before, and someone was saying, that uh, Apple is no longer using the i anymore. It's no longer iPhone and iPod that they're going to some other term. Um, iHealth, is that an actual company? It looks like it is. Self-test. Future products. Thermo thermometer, blood pressure monitor, 40 bucks. Composition scale, I don't know what that means, but that's interesting. Glucose monitors, $72. Glucose, glucose monitoring bundle. Air pulse, I have one of these. It didn't cost me $60 though, so mine, mine may not be all that good. But uh, have y'all used one of these? A, a bunch of you were buying these during COVID because you know this the number drops if you have COVID. So. 60 bucks. It looks interesting. I mean, that's a lot of home tests. Do things yourself. What are doctors going to say? Well, we can't have consumers doing this stuff. They're going to mess up. My, my COVID test came back negative, but I'm not sure I did it exactly right. So I was almost going to do it again. I thought, you know what? It's a negative test. I probably got a cold, so I'll, I'll be fine. And then 
two days later, I was perfectly fine. I could have had COVID with just a bad test, but who knows? Um, it saved him several visits to the doctors. By letting doctors and carers monitor patients remotely, making it simpler, the mobile health industry or M Health aims to drive down costs. So you may you might even try that. I don't know if that's a really a phrase or not. M Health, I don't hear that a lot. What are the advantages of M Health? You could probably find a good article out there that can be your ten percent. This may alert them to the need for action well before, below the, before the patient's condition can deteriorates. Given that America is average cost on nice same hospitals, 4,300, there's significant savings. Uh, avert health prices by checking that patients are taking their medicines. Um, the goal is to save money while improving health. The average annual cost of treating sufferers from high blood pressure who fail to take their medicine is nearly $4,000 more than those who take their pills reliably. Y'all learn this in about 50 years. It's really hard to remember which pills you take and when. You have, you have grandparents that have like 20 pill boxes and they've got to say, which one have I taken? They have the little daily thing. The problem with that is I, have, I only have to take two pills. One of them I have to take after fasting for eight hours. The other one I have to take with food. Like I can't take them at the same time. So I have to have two different, you know, and, and I just can't remember if I took it or not. <clears throat> Um, more innovations. Startup Health says that 421 young companies have raised more than $3 billion. Insurers and hospitals begin testing ways to boost efficiency. Employers are making their staff pay for more in cash. The law is packed with demands that caps a proportion of insurers' revenue that can go to profits and administration, slashes government payments to hospitals and, and ask dollars, doctors who have profited from helping heaping treatments on patients to start keeping them well instead. So there are attempts. This is an old article. So I actually don't think this is has, has kept up as well as these articles suggest. But there was some excitement when the Affordable Care Act came out. There was a lot of startups saying, hey, we're going to take advantage of this wave. I just don't think it's it's done as well. But research it and see if some of these firms are having an impact. Um, again, monitoring sugar levels. Um, he thinks things could be improved further by using software to make these devices work together what, as what would affect me in artificial pancreas. I've created an app called House an iPhone, which receives data every five minutes on the glucose monitor. Uh, the combination of detector algorithm and pumps reduced the amount of time patients spent low blood pressure. If y'all know someone with diabetes, you might ask them, has their life changed? Anybody know? People with diabetes, their life changed dramatically with this new stuff. I mean, is it radical or is it minor? Is it more expensive, less expensive? You know, that's kind of, I, I don't know. Um, but it would be interesting to, to hear. So those kind of things I give the 10% part because I'm always curious. If you got a relative in this case, you want to put that in your paper, that's fine. You don't have to give me their name or anything. Amazon. So Amazon's been in the news. Amazon will be able to sell prescription drugs to customers. So that was a, a big thing. Amazon, you know, if they start competing with pharmacies, with Walgreens and CVS. Last year, the vast majority of prescriptions were picked up in person. Amazon can simplify the process of filling them at the same time and offer cheaper prices. Amazon is also part of a three-way venture. Some of y'all probably heard of this. This would be another thing you could research. They're creating a non Nonprofit healthcare venture. The venture will target excessive administrative costs, high prices, and improper medical care. It will initially be aimed at the, their employees. I thought this was a pretty big deal, but I have a student who's a former student who took this class, who's a consultant in this business. He he doesn't think they're really doing the right things. He doesn't think it's as big as what they're saying it was, but I was interested. Um, I don't know what it's called. So you could probably try to find, find um, Amazon joint venture. How would you look it up? I think everybody knows JP Morgan's a bank. So there's stuff out there. That by itself could probably get you the 10%. 
So why do you do the 10% and it's the one that's like, well, that's really interesting. All right. <laughs> Don't do the 10% on why that sounds really easy. All right. That sounds really interesting. Do it on that one. That way your paper would be more, more exciting to read. Uh, the venture will target. Yeah, we, we just did that one. The week three of the biggest names American business announced an adventure. Yeah, radical change demands a shift in emphasis from providers to patients. So a little bit more on that. Better diagnostics. Apps are vying to see if they can diagnose everything from skin cancer to Parkinson's disease. Um, diabetes apps, video game. These, these have gotten pretty interesting to help people who have problem with balance and those kind of things. It's, we actually had one of my former students, they, they were working on a... I think it was a program related to memory and using music. It was really, really fascinating. Um, improving efficiency, data at their fingertips, tips, common standards to enable sharing and a strong incentive to get things right. Aggressive generation and the aggregation of their data. AI, AI is a big part of this. AI, we'll, we'll see more of that. AI has actually shown itself to be almost as good as doctors in many places, so a lot cheaper. Identify cancerous tissues and retinal damage. Apple has spent three years preparing its devices and software to process medical data. data. Millions of Americans have direct digital control of their own health. So digitizing the bodies is a big part of this technology wave. Alphabet has just launched this thing again. There it is, City Block Health. So you could easily Google that and see if there's anything there. See if it's still in place. What does it do? Be seen, be heard, be healthy. Compassionate care that's built around you because your time, feelings, and story matter. Sounds sounds good so far. But you might go on a website and, and see is all the problems we talked about. How do they actually address those problems? How are they bringing down costs for improving care? So there may be something there. Alphabet already claims to be able to use AIs to predict possible deaths of hospitalized patients two days earlier than current methods. All five firms have secretive health care. Uh, Skunk Works are hiring medical talent and buying or backing external health care stars. I, I like this. I like it when firms that are dominating other markets are coming into health care. I think it's an industry that needs to be shaken up. I wish someone would do that with education, but definitely health care could certainly use it. Use the very plat various platforms to create entirely new channels through which medical care can be delivered. Uses the hospital's data to generate alerts that draw doctors' attention, more AI stuff. The data so far suggests Apple's platform may soon enable medics to spot Parkinson's digitally over the internet before it's symptomatic in a patient. City Block will trial, you all know what that word, I don't know what that word means data to spot where care is needed. It plans to hire some 55 people over the next six months, including data scientists, software engineers, and lead physician, as well as a team to interact directly with patients. 55 people for a firm that has, you know, a couple million employees or whatever they have. Doesn't sound like much, but it, it, is, it is an investment. Um, more on apps, email was just technology our place. Measure whether patients are adhering to their treatment. Many apps will compete to treat the same disease, which should spark innovation, a rare phenomenon in medicine, and perhaps even lower prices. Artificial intelligence. So yeah, this, all of this tech, service quality, electronic records, integration, reduced costs. Machine learning to tell those patients who need urgent attention from those who, who may safely wait by analyzing scans of their brains made on admission. Those projects have a common aim to get to the right patient, to the right doctor at the right time. There is an AI skin cancer detection system that can, can do better than most dermatologists. That's pretty impressive. The humans are able to identify 86% of skin cancers. The computer finds 95%. It also misdiagnosed fewer benign moles as malignancies. That's impressive, isn't it? Would you rather a computer doing this than a dermatologist? 
what is the big advantage of AI? So this is the same thing we have with self-driving cars. The advantage of AI is every doctor in the planet has the same knowledge instantaneously. So it's like every car, well, if there's something AI learns for, for autonomous cars, so suddenly every driver in the world becomes a better driver instantaneously. What if a doctor finds something, writes a paper and publishes it in a, you know, some AMA journal? When, do every, when does every doctor learn that? Well, it's gonna be over months and months and months, but AI, it's immediately, every software package is updated, the AI is there, every doctor now knows the same thing at the same time, we all benefit immediately. It's, it's an amazing, amazing uh, push in innovation and efficiency. Um, at a minimum, it gives you a second opinion. And it may be on the great women according to the risk of breast cancer and decide best time for the next mammogram. So it may be that cheap second opinion that you're looking for. The nice thing about the AI is an AI computer doesn't get paid for cutting you open like the doctor does. So it may be an unbiased second opinion. Cardiologists looking at these scans are searching for signs of heart disease, but can miss 20%. This means the patients will be sent home and may then go have a heart attack. AI, however, can detect changes invisible to the eye and improve the accuracy of diagnosis. Diagnosis. Not just AI. Have y'all heard about dogs and cats being used and smell and those kind of things? You know, we're we're finding new ways that are better than humans. AI might also make medicine more specific, being able to draw distinctions between that, that elude human observations. It may be able to grade cancers or instances of cardiac disease according to their risk. Thus, for example, distinguishing between those prostate cancers that will kill and those that need treatment and those that will not. Mark Cuban, so here's another one. This is a recent article. Did y'all see that? Y'all remember seeing this in the mail? And we got these billionaires, they're bored, they want to do something. You can buy Twitter, you can you know, start something with medicine. It's your billions, so what are you going to do? Reducing the price of the blue pill from several thousand dollars, several dollars a pop to 11 cents. It was one of 87 drugs that Mark Cuban, cost plus drug company, added to its growing assortment of chief outpatient medicines. A new study finds that his prices might have saved Medicare. 3.6 billion on uh, 9.6 billion dollar worth of drugs. So how is he doing that? You might research that. That'd be interesting. Drugs in America are notoriously dear. 2019 spending on prescription medicines came in at 1.1 $1,126 for citizens, twice as other rich countries. His company buys these directly from manufacturers and sells them to customers at cost, plus a 15% markup and a 3% pharmacy fee. Now, is that possible to get those kind of savings? I was reading a book I'm reading right now that I'm not telling you the name of. They're talking about products that cost $10 to make that they're selling for $3,000. Yeah, there's some savings that we have there. Now, what's the pharmaceutical going to say? Yeah, it's $10 to make and $3,000, but it costs us $3 billion to develop it, so we got to get our money back. That's still going to be their argument. But I think people, most people know uh, the American consumer is paying for the rest of the world. So yeah, ours are much more expensive in the U.S. Um, they're also this other group is also trying to bring down prices. In March, it said it would manufacture gen generic insulin and not more than thirty dollars a vial, down from three hundred dollars for today's branded versions. Now, what's going to happen when a firm does that? There's a very powerful group of lobbyists and pharmacies that obviously are going to fight this pretty hard. So there's some pretty strong enemies out there. In America, patented medicines, the drugs inventor has a great deal of pricing power, drives prices higher. The final wrinkle is that any medicine seller who undercuts incumbents becomes a target and just gets acquired by them. Cuban shares the sentiment, I don't have a reason to sell. I can afford to absorb the losses that come from starting the company. Maybe that's the solution. You get billionaires you get into this industry and they don't care if they make money. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we've already covered that. Again, another article on Alphabet and what it's doing, the sick of this industry. Um, we already talked through that, so a little more on what they're doing. So you might research that more and see if there's anything there. I haven't heard much about this in, a, in quite some time. So I think it came out, hit the news, and it's been quiet since there. Um, so Alphabet's health 
Adventures can be divided in four broad categories, wearables, digital records, AI, and, and then extending longevity. He's, yeah, we've had a few billionaires that I'll, that I don't think they want to die because they like kind of like being billionaires. So they're trying to figure out if they can live to be 150. The company intends to produce, intends its products to be more fun consumer gadgets, influence the practice of, actually, actually able to influence the practice of medicine. Google is also giving health records another world. Alphabet's AI projects are also beginning to produce results. The most out there part of Alphabet's health portfolio is an effort to slow the aging process of stuff it all together. Calico. Now, what does that do to the healthcare costs in the United States? People retired 65 and now they lived 150 instead of the 85. That kind of changes everything, right? We, we never stop working. Do y'all want to live to 150? That sounds fun to you. If you were as healthy as you were when you're 18, maybe. Um, all right, I love this article. Okay, we're, we're doing well. We're doing well. We're, we're almost to the end here. All right, this guy here, I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, uh, Davey, whatever. Um, he, I mean, this, this, this seems incredible, but I love that there's people out there like they're like, I'm going to destroy the whole system and, 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 and make it much more affordable. He has cut the price of coronary bypass surgery from $1,500 to $800. At Ohio Cleveland Clinic, it was $106,000. 800, I mean, some of these are say the same unbelievable, don't they? $800 versus $106,000. So you say, well, he must be killing people left and right. The chain uses web-based computer software to run logistics rather than licensing, building expensive new systems. So I'll give you his quality here in a little bit. Some come for treatment they cannot get at home. Others escape long waiting lists. This is uh, medical tourism. Consumers are incentivized to travel. The average heart valve replacement is 35,000 in Germany. It's only, you gotta do the math here. So it's, it's only about 10,000 Austria. In Britain, it's 12,000, 10,000 in Turkey, only 4,000 in Poland. So you live in Germany. Germany's not that far from Poland, is it? You could drive, couldn't you, from Germany to Poland, I think, without too much trouble. Uh, I think we drove from Poland to Germany, so I know you can probably turn around and go the other way. Um, so would it be worth it to cut your cost 90% to go over to Poland? You'd ask about the quality. We'll talk about that here in a second. Cutting edge, Costa Rica is a travel. In fact, the doctors we work with in Costa Rica, I've seen him on Facebook advertising on vacation in Costa Rica and will treat your heart disease for one, one eighth the cost. Um, they say Costa Rica for dentistry. <laughs> we have a dentist in Costa Rica. She charges $1 for teeth, teeth cleanings, but not for Americans, only for Costa Ricans. So you know, look. So if you're US citizen, I think she charges like $20 or something. But pretty inexpensive. A dollar for teeth cleanings is pretty good. And if you don't have a dollar, she'll take a chicken instead. Um, so you can see these are the places that are best known for, for medical tourism. Here are some firms based in Berlin. Hope to improve matters. They allow patients to search for medical treatments from a large selection of providers, offering a clear information about pricing and quality, which is important. You don't want to just shop on pricing. That's pretty obvious, but if we can get pricing and quality, what's that going to do? Well, first of all, you're going to save a lot of money, but it's also when you tell uh, Methodist Hospital, no, I'm going to fly to Poland to have this done because it cost me 2000 to fly and I'm going to save $3,000 in my MSA, they start feeling pressure. You tell all your friends on Facebook, you know, that's, it gets interesting. Fewer American patients came then expected partly because health insurers were not interested in sending people overseas, but that's got to change. You got to change their incentives. Um, I don't want to cover the Affordable Care Act, so if you want to read through that, that's fine. But I'm going to skip through that. Affordable Care Act again. More Affordable Care Act. So if you want to read Affordable Care Act. It looks like Portal Care Act has definitely reduced the uninsured. 
it looks like most of that's because of Medicare being expanded or Medicaid being expanded, but it certainly has reduced the number of insured. It doesn't seem like it's done much to reduce prices, but it, it, does, it, has, it has reduced the number of insured. So I, I should have taken the Affordable Care Act ones. Okay, so that's that article. So before we do this last article, let's let's look through the rubric and see what I've missed talking about. So this first part, pretty straightforward. Players and in incentive, y'all got those down. Patient. Healthcare. Providers. Insurers. Employers. Govern. Did I leave any out? So who are these players? What are their incentives? What's the incentive for an impatient? Get well, but not spend too much time to do it. Healthcare providers, their current incentive is to treat as many people as possible. It's a volume-based type. Their incentive is not to make the patient well. In fact, they're paid more if they don't make the patient well. Insurers, they want to cover, but they don't want to spend too much money. But one thing we haven't talked about on insurers, which I think is really, really critical, this is a cost plus business. When you have a cost plus business, the higher your cost, the higher your revenues. So they're almost incentive, incentivized to go ahead and cover things. So if the Affordable Care Act says, hey, for every $80 you pay out in claims, you can have $100 in revenues, then you increase what you're paying out, your revenues go up and you actually make more money. So cost plus is not a good incentive even on the insurance side. You would think insurers out there would be fighting and fighting and fighting. They do to some extent, but their incentives are not as strong as you might think. Employers, what are they trying to do? They're thinking compensation. Healthcare is a cost to them. If they give you more health care, they're going to give you less salary. So their incentives is give you enough health care that you don't quit your job. And government, what's their goal? Re-election. Which means what? Extremely short term. The incentives are all messed up, all mixed up. It's, it's hard to fix a, a major massive system like this. All right, technology is an example of distortions. We talked about that. That's where you definitely want to do the LASIK versus you know something something else. So I think you had in the um, in the movie you had the example on the prostate cancer, that new machine, that massive new machine, definitely not bringing costs down, and they're not even sure it does even better. That's a pretty good example, robotics. Definitely costs are going up, it's more expensive and we have no data to say it, it actually improves care. That's the kind of thing I'm looking at. Whereas LASIK, costs and LASIK have come down. What's the key? Insurance. It's covered by insurance. The person paying for it doesn't care about the cost because the insurance is paying for it. If it's not covered by insurance, it looks more like regular consumer product. Healthcare tied to employment, tax treatment, those two go together, remember that. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the tax treatment here in a little bit. Any efficiency of the insurance model is the exact same thing we talked about earlier. So the key here I would say is that 80%. So don't forget that 80%, you charge $100 in premium to pay $80 in claims. So the, the Affordable Care Act is saying for every $100 of premiums you take in, you must get 80. So what is um, insurance doing? It's increasing medical costs. 20 Every time insurance touches something, costs go up 25%. So when do you want to use insurance? As infrequently as possible. 
low frequency, high severity events. Why? Because insurance does nothing but add costs. And you see that every time you visit the doctor, you give them that insurance card, and this whole massive amount of paperwork is going to about it's going to happen in the background. They got to call people, they got to file claims. There's a massive amount of work. So that's what I'm talking about here is everything health insurance touches us more. Why? We're the middleman, the middle person, whatever you want to say. Insurance is just a middle middleman, middle person. They're just in there in between. They're not adding any value, They're just kind of helping, which is great. Insurance is great for those low frequency, high severity events. They're really wonderful at that. It keeps the cost down because there aren't that many, there's not that many transactions, and they provide incredible peace of mind for those massive events that aren't going to happen very much. So you hardly ever see the insurance company. But when you see them, boy, those rare events, you're really glad to see them. Health insurance doesn't work like that. Insurance is covering physical exams and all kinds of normal things, right? You should have plenty of examples there. From the movie, the, the, that one lady talked about how health healthcare mistakes is the third leading cause. We're going to see in the class notes, we have some more examples on that. Malpractice, just mention it. That one's a simple one. Something along the lines, some people think healthcare is expensive in the United States because of the heavy uh, legal liability and, and instance of suing. And because of that, doctors follow defensive medicine. I'm not looking for much on that. Fraud and waste, we said we're going to put the incentives here, didn't we? There was a lot we could add to that one. I forget what we did, but there was one article we added a lot. So hopefully you have that in there. So that one, we've expanded that one somewhat. Excessive regulation, bureaucratic work. The second article talked about that and probably quotes from that article and just mentioning it gives you full credits. I'm not actually looking for much there. I just want you to acknowledge this is a heavily regulated industry, a lot of bureaucratic paperwork. Governments really don't help here. They tend to be focused on the wrong kind of things. Incentives, again, doctors are incentivized to treat us more, not treat us less. They're incentivized to find stuff. Because of that, we develop technology that really good at finding stuff that won't kill us, and then we treat it. So here, I really want you to draw on money in medicine. You don't have to quote it directly, but... They gave several examples there on breast cancer. Well, they, they gave treatment and testing. They gave both of those examples. So they gave the examples of cesarean sections, end of life on the treatment, and they gave examples of uh, mammograms and PSA tests on the over testing. American Lifestyles, um, there's a couple of articles on that. That you can quote from. I think in the US it's it's sedentary life and and eating habits. Our our food industry tends to not do us any favors. <clears throat> it's not smoking, it's not drinking. If you know um I don't there are probably some other things that you could probably bring in bring into that. Um driving, I don't know about suicide rates in the U.S. Um, so I, I don't know where other places, so I don't know where we line up versus other countries, but uh, I think eating exercise is one area where we're probably worse than other countries, but the other countries are catching up with us, I think. All right, I gave you several examples of this. Don't forget that there's two things in here. If you only get one of them, you may have. So bring an example. Now, why is this important? This is evidence of lack of competition. What does competition do? It tends to make the overpriced, low quality ones go out of business. The good ones do well and they get even better to get more efficient. But healthcare, we don't see that. There's some people, and we just saw one today. Someone's charging $200, someone's charging $800 or whatever. It's all over the place. Um, and the quality difference, I've just today, I gave you examples on prostate cancer, the quality difference in the treatment. 
I think even money and medicine might have mentioned a few of those as well. So you've got some examples. But don't, don't just mention it. Why is it so important? You don't see this in other industries. You wouldn't walk into McDonald's and there's just trash everywhere. The, the food costs $800. It's got you know roaches in the food. And, just, and then next door is Wendy's. Everything's clean. The food costs $8. I and mean, what would you do? You'd stop going to McDonald's, right? But this industry's not like that. We have these horrible differences and we just keep, we just let them exist. Why? Because insurance is hiding everything. Inefficiency is encouraged. I love the quote from medicine, but I can't remember what he said. Can you anybody remember? I am paid to harm my patients. Is that how he said it? He said something along those lines. I'm, I'm rewarded for harming my patients. I forget this. I remember the guy early in, in the you could give a lot of examples of this. Uh, I think infections picked up at the hospital. That second, that second article, he talked about how the hospital actually made his father worse off, and they, he had to come back and cost more money, and he ended up killing him. So there's a lot of examples there. So really fill that out. Information in asymmetry is that one. I don't know if you have a quote on that one, but just explain that one. Doctors, and it kind of comes back up here. I, I would, if I were you, I'd almost move this one up to these. Don't you, you see how those are related? Doctors are incentivized to treat us. They're incentivized to test us. They're incentivized to give us drugs and operate on us and why do we accept it because we assume they know more than we do and they can demand these kind of things i i, I think it was the movie that talked about um uh south texas so you have a doctor that works for a hospital that has empty beds and the treatment says the patient needs to stay one or two days. Well, so that's two days. <laughs> you have a doctor who has a hospital, has a shortage of beds. Well, you can stay one day. So that incentivizes, you know, the doctor should be saying what's in the best interest of the patient. But if they have extra beds, hey, stay two days. What's the patient thinking? Well, my insurance is covering it. What do I care? I mean, I would rather go home if I were the patient. But the doctor says, we need to keep you here for observation. You're probably thinking, well, if I go home, we're going to die. So yeah, I think I'll stay here. That's that asymm asymmetric information. Uh, you got this in money and medicine as well. Governments focus on prices, not on costs. And if you don't bring down costs, and I think we have some pretty good articles that when you tell medic when Medicare says you can't do this anymore, doctors just do more of something else. And that was a good quote to put in that section. We didn't cover this one. Um, I can't remember where I talked about that, but it's it's in there somewhere. It might be in, it might have been in the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, so I, I can't remember what made it's in the class notes, so you might have to. We'll see. I, I'll, I'll, that's one I'll have to mark in red. If, you know, do y'all remember us talking about that? So there's been, uh, there, there's somewhere in one of these articles that uh, it may be in the very last book we have here, but there's some debate about, you've all heard a story about these, these interns. We have the, you know, the TV shows that they're working these ridiculously long hours and they're all stressed out. And there's a lot of people who think we're really doing doctor training incorrectly. That we could get doctors out faster. They actually be better trained. And so I had an article on that, but I thought I had it in here somewhere. We'll see if we can find it. But there are people challenging the whole foundation that it just, just doesn't make sense. And because of that, we're, we're not finding enough doctors. One key here is specialists make more. 
But if we're going to solve healthcare, we need to be using more primary care doctors to keep people away from specialists because the specialists, again, they have that incentive to treat people or they may not need the treatment. You're better off going to a primary care doctor that's well-trained, that's, that's uh, going to consult others, that's going to get you to the right place and be thinking about the cost as well as your security versus a specialist who just wants to cut you open. Pre-existing conditions is... We've talked about it, we've alluded to it, you need to talk about it. So the key here is how do you ensure them? We're going to talk about more on that with taxes, but that's a really key issue. It was a big issue with the Portal Care Act. It was a big issue for Hillary Clinton. We have these uninsured people and they have diabetes or they have heart disease. We need to insure them. But obviously they're going to be really, really expensive. How do we how do we handle that? So the government said the solution is mandates. Everyone must buy insurance. That was the Affordable Care Act solution. If you make everybody get insured, then you have more healthy people covering the unhealthy, and that's how it's going to work. What does that imply? That implies you're intentionally overcharging the healthy people so that you can subsidize the unhealthy. That's the argument. And that's the argument I make back to why they want young people. We'll see that definitely in the last book. So pre-existing is pretty, pretty important. What's my solution? My solution is tax credits. You automatically overnight have everybody insured. Baby boomers just mentioned it. That's obviously an issue. You talk about baby boomers, I think in the first four articles, I mean, we keep seeing baby boomers, right? Blame everything on us. End of life care, I gave you more than enough on that. We've had several articles last class, so you should be in good shape there. Plus the movie gave you a lot. And uninsured Americans, I showed you how you can actually update that to the current numbers. So I Googled that. So you can say that definitely has improved and you can put a little bit more in, in there, but I usually, on, on pre-existing conditions and uninsured Americans, I, I usually just let you bring up the issue and talk, give me a little bit of data, but um, pretty easy to get your points on that. All right, so any questions on the uh, intro and the problems? I think we've covered most of these. You have some really good quotes. There's anything in your notes where you have nothing in one of these other than primary care doctors? Did y'all have stuff in everywhere else? All right, solutions. That one somewhat is implied when you do the first article. So the first article is going to be in your intro. So it's somewhat implied, but bring it back down here. Insurance. So my solution is very much what we've been seeing in so many articles is less insurance or out of pocket. And why is that? Well, we just talked about it. insurance just adds costs. So you know, and when I think about it, insurance adds cost, changes behavior, incentives. So adds cost just because insurance companies cost money and then changes incentives. This is that consumerism. The argument is you can't have consumerism if insurance is paying for 85, 90% of the stuff. Because then the consumer has no incentive to do anything. So insurance, I don't know how many articles we saw, we saw that said insurance is the problem, but that's what we're arguing here. We've got to reduce the use of insurance. What did the Affordable Care Act do? And increase the use of insurance. It did the exact opposite. How do you get the consumer paying more, more out of pocket? then that's where the MSA comes out. So this is very much article one. The very first thing we talked about. We call it insurance, but that's not healthy. Very first part. Tax credits, I'm gonna talk more about those here, maybe a little bit next class. Uh, and then consumerism. We gotta get patients, so let's talk about consumerism. Or out of pocket. and more information. Information on what? Cost and quality. 
So you don't have all of that. You don't have consumers paying more because if insurance is paying for everything, giving consumers more information on costs, they're like, who cares? The insurance company is paying for it. So you, you got to have them paying for more, but then they need cost information. So we can't have this thing where you have these surprise bills afterwards, or you're being, you know, the guy in the gurney going in and going into surgery. And it's like, can you sign this? Because we're going to charge you a lot more money. It's like, well, no, I, I want to know what this thing costs before I go in for surgery. And then what is the quality? Which doctors are better? Do y'all have any problem with this, with fast food? Do you know where costs and quality are? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Do you have any problems with that with, with department stores? Is that, is that a, but heart surgery? How many of y'all know this on heart surgery? We have no clue, right? So consumerism, consumer pays more, but they have to have the information. And if they don't have the information, then they you can't have consumerism. I guess we should add one more thing and um, outcomes, um, impact life, right? I guess they should have information on that. I don't know on, on the prostate cancer ones, it sounded like those patients did have the information. You know, one in 15 is saved, 14 out of 15 is not saved. They seem to have known that, but they all said, well, but I don't wanna take the chance. But then you had the one guy said, I'll, I'll monitor for now, maybe later. But is this important? Men deciding to have PSA, women deciding to have mammograms in their 40s. Will data make better decisions? You saw the one lady in the, in the video and the doctor gave her the information and said, yeah, I better be better safe than sorry. But, but what does the status say? You're better off not having it because you'll be better off. But it was kind of confusing. The data says she's better off not having the test, but she's saying better safe than sorry. So this is the part that, that might be the most difficult of what Porter's proposing. The goal is that our lives are better, that we're healthier, that we're going getting back to work faster, those kind of things. How do we get that information to consumers in a way they can actually understand it? That may be a, that's that's more than quality, isn't it? So, so you should have some good quotes on that. Untie insurance to the employer. That to me is part of consumerism. It's, I, the reason I think it's part of consumerism is we don't, I mean, what else do you, what else does your employer buy for you? Well, think of many things your employer purchases for you. Maybe your car, if you're an executive. I never quite got that high up. It was, it was like one level away for having a car. I, I love, I was, BP got this great parking spot on the top floor and I was driving this like 10 year old beat up old used car. I so love it. My, my staff was so embarrassed. Did you like park somewhere else? But yeah, so I could have gotten a car, uh, health care. They gave me gym membership and then they took that away. And, you know, so what is it? But what was the most expensive thing they were giving me rather than making the car? But health insurance. Why? Why are they giving me that one thing and not something else? Uh, tech. So we talk a lot tonight about tech. Tech can reduce these costs, the digitizing of the, the human body, the digitizing of medical records having data so we can compare prices compare quality this is a lot of this is part of the consumerism we got to get this stuff to the consumer in a way they can use it and tech is going to help it i forgot to put in here ai and what ai is going to do um wearables just a lot of stuff on tech that can really, really help this problem effectiveness of treatments that's kind of what i'm talking about here this last part the effectiveness of treatments. We've got to somehow let consumers know knee surgery is no more effective than rehab. Knee surgery costs several thousand dollars. Rehab costs a few hundred dollars. Consumers need to know that. Is it enough to have them do it out of pocket? Will that make them astute enough consumers that they'll ask those kind of questions? Or will they just rely on the doctor? 
So I don't know the answers to those. That's what you can talk about in your paper. What is it going to take for consumers to make really good decisions that aligns with the statistics? Hospital talk, talk, checklist, a checklist. We had that in the second article. And I don't know if you remember it in the very second article, that promo, whatever it's called. Um, anybody remember what I'm talking about? You can get that entirely from that article. It's right in the first paragraph, I think, even. Yeah, I can't. Y'all remember what it's called? It's oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, so there it is on page whatever. Very first page. Yeah, how did I miss it? It was right there. Oh, my word. Oh, it wasn't highlighted in yellow. So, yeah, so hospital infection rates reduced by two thirds, three first three months of its adoption. The class notes also talk about this. Nope. So here, one survey showed that before video was used, only 6.5% of surgeons washed their hands before surgery. After the video, this rose to more than 90%. Why wouldn't a surgeon wash their hands? Does that make sense? Do you, you wanna be operating on someone who doesn't wash their hands before surgery? Um, yeah, it's just it's pretty, pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, so that one's a pretty simple one, just bring it in. Incentives for healthy living. So I gave you the Safeway article. Here's where I want you to think outside the box. Here's where you can write about stuff that I haven't given you anything on. So this was my big argument. Why do we need incentives? To me, the fact that you only get one body and you can't ever get another one, to me, should be incentive enough. But what incentive could we get? So what about insurers paying for travel or gym or bonus or weight loss? Would any of that stuff work? My opinion is you shouldn't need those incentives, but I may be real wrong on that. There may be people out there, you give them 10,000 bucks if they lose 50 pounds, that would be enough to get them to get to the gym. To me, I think I've already got enough incentive as it is. And I think most people want to be healthy, but you know, you've got you got all these battles in our culture with you know fast food everywhere and all these kind of things. It's tough. It's tough to do that. Um, with ten thousand dollars be enough. You know, people have probably been battling already. So I don't know. I mean, get back to um, Oprah. I mean, she's been battling with weight. And this is a billionaire. You think a billionaire could just have someone walk around with her all day long and say, "No, you can't do that. You, gotta, this, you don't have enough steps." Uh, if she struggles with it, how does the average person have any hope whatsoever? So I, I don't know. More ten thousand dollars would be enough, but maybe so. Maybe there's some people out there that's just all they need. But think through that. I don't know if y'all have any ideas there. How can we get people to have healthier lives, especially if a healthy life will save the insurance company twenty thousand? And sharing that ten thousand, you know, it end up saving the entire system money. And we're not talking about people um, running marathons. They just need to get out and walk 30 minutes a day would probably be enough to really, really cut the cost. So I don't know. <laughs> Process and human improvements. I haven't talked much about this one. So this is one I probably shouldn't have on the list. But essentially what I want to say here is the system is inefficient. Why? Because it's not competitive. There's no incentive. So a good example, just I see it all the time, but my doctor calls and leaves a voicemail. You have an, you have an appointment tomorrow. Please call the confer. All right. Does that sound like it should call back or not? Please call the confer. Now I'm thinking I have an appointment tomorrow, so I should call the cancel, but it says, please call the confirm. They charge me money if I don't show up. So now I'm worried if I don't call back, they'll cancel it. 
and charge me, you know, so what are they? So I'll call back, right? That's what you do, you call back. I get this person that's different. So I asked for the person that I called from. They said, oh, she's not here. I said, well, I cannot, you know, I'll leave our message and the lady gets real huffy with me. She said, she was real mad that I didn't know this lady didn't work there on that day that she worked at the other office. I should have known that. So I said, well, can you transfer it to her? And she helped me. She sighs, like, you're irritating me. So she gives me the number. She doesn't transfer me. So I call the other office. I get this lady. She can't find me on the system. So I keep giving her my birthday and date. Finally, she finds me on the system. And she goes, okay, why did you call? I said, well, you called me to confirm my appointment. So I'm just calling. She gives me the most sarcastic. She was, like, so irritated. I called her. She gives me a sarcastic, well, you're confirmed, sir, now. I was like, why are you wasting my time? Well, I'm wasting your time because you asked me to waste your time. Now, could that have been done better? Like maybe a text appointment tomorrow type yes to confirm. Would that have been easier? There are software companies that do that for like, I don't know, $10 a month. <laughs> Should they have done that? I told the doctor, I said, yeah, you got some, you could save a lot of money in this office. And he was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He didn't care. I think you've got, you have these people at the reception office. They're answering, and I can understand why she was frustrated. She's answering the phone like this. She's also on the computer. This is stupid. Why is the office so inefficient? It just doesn't care. There's not that idea. So it's just ridiculous how inefficient. I could give you 20 stories like that. It's just crazy how inefficient these offices are. Um, but I had my eyes, my eyes checked. Yeah, all the paperwork I did in advance on the computer, I walked in, they saw me in 30 seconds, checked my eyes, I left, I was gone. Why? Because I paid for that out of my pocket, the insurance. So this is an industry that's terribly inefficient. So is education. Education is terribly inefficient. Healthcare is terribly inefficient. Why? Because it's not a competitive market. Okay, we talked this, this just goes with end of life care. So this is, if end of life care is such an issue, it causes a lot of costs, what would be your solution on that? So maybe you take this back to money and medicine if you want to. I know it's a touchy issue. I still, I can just picture that, that, sweet, that sweet mother in the deathbed just thinking, would she want this? What should Medicare have said to that, that, that uh, son? So, you know, you, you're not going to offend me, whatever you say. It's your opinion. So whatever you want to say there. Medical tourism, we just saw that in the last article there. You can actually type that. So that last article gives you some good quotes there. So should insurance pay for air travel? Now, Porter is actually encouraging this, right? Because he's saying there shouldn't be 500 uh, heart, heart hospitals. There should be five key ones that do a high volume. And so you should, if you're in San Antonio, you may have to go to Phoenix or you may have to go to uh, Dallas. So insurance should pay for that because it's gonna be cheaper anyway, even with the travel, it's gonna be cheaper. So that's, that's part of that question. If you wanna argue Medicare for all, you can. If you wanna argue against it, it you can't write a paper like this without at least bringing it up. So you're gonna to have to address it, yes or no. If you're gonna argue for it, you're gonna have to address the issues. I'm gonna bring up the next class from our very last book. And you can get your 10% here if you wanna to go to Bernie Sanders, Sanders' website and just see what his arguments are. What is he claiming? <laughs> this one, I don't know where it belongs. I just stuck it in here. You have that one article on this. You can just talk about that there, have whatever solution you would have there. Michael Porter, you have a whole article there. And then your other, I say it's 10%, but you know, here it only says, says two, but other really is 10%. So you can give me something to work with. All right, so I covered most everything except for those two things. And this that's probably all you need there. The class notes have some stuff we didn't we didn't necessarily cover. Um, yeah, I think actually a lot of these are covered in Porter's. 
Oh, here's the process improvements. It's in the class notes right there. So page, page 46 of the class notes, number nine, 14% of revenues of doctors and hospitals is simply keeping up with the claims management process. Paper, paper records, poor communication, lack of standardization. Yeah, I think I've covered most of this stuff. Okay. So we only have two last things to cover. One is I do wanna go through this. I don't have much on this. I mean, it's 32 pages, but I don't have much highlighted in here. I do recommend this book. Unfortunately, it's only in paper form. I don't think they've had it um, on Audible unless they've done it since I've read it. Uh, these are all my handwritten notes. I'm sure there's some typos in here. I mean, I typed all 32 of these pages. Um, so it's a pretty incredible book. I don't always trust books like this. This one's really heavy. I mean, half the book is their bibliography at the end. I somewhat trust it because it's coming from Cato, and I do trust Cato. I've always liked Cato. I know a lot of known people at Cato that do really good research. So that's one reason I put it in there. Um, some really incredible pieces of information in here. Um, this is where I, I get the uh, how much young people are subsidizing the elderly. So you can see there's not that many quotes. So we'll get through it fairly quickly. We'll definitely finish it. Um, there's some really shocking stuff in here. I think uh, the book I'm reading right now talks about just the fraud and deception and how much Congress is owned by these industries. Um, one example he uses, I don't know if I have it highlighted in here, but uh, just Medicare finding fraud, trying to shut it down and Congress saying you can't shut it down. you got to keep paying that company money. It's just the incredible waste. And why is that? And what you discover is Congress cares more about voters than taxpayers. Well, how is that possible? They're the same people, aren't they? But that's not how Congress thinks. <laughs> they do stuff to get people to vote for them, even though they know it's wasting a lot of taxpayer money. It's inefficiently paid. Why? Because they don't talk about who's paying for stuff. They only talk about who's getting the money, who's getting the. And so you see that over and over again. The other thing you say is Congress is being paid. I help there. So they're trying to buy voters by killing taxpayers. And they also got to get reelected. So they're getting a bunch of kickbacks from this industry. Can you fix that? Is there any way to fix that? And I don't know if there are. I'm, I'm in a camp that thinks democracy is failing in the United States uh, because there's just there's too many bad incentives. If the book I'm reading right now is correct, it's like hopeless. It's just like, it's just it's infuriating to think. So we'll see some of that stuff in here. Some pretty shocking things. I do trust these guys. I can't tell you 100%, but I read it yourself and, and um, look at the bibliography. The one other thing I do want to address is the tax issues. So we're going to come back to this one. I want you just to see the pieces on how they work with that. I can't give you real life numbers because I don't have access to them. So I'm going to give you some kind of ballpark ways of thinking about it. Uh, what if employers stop providing insurance, instead put all that money into your salary, put some of it into an MSA, you got tax credits. Is it possible that the employer could be no worse off or better off, the employee could be a lot better off and the taxpayer could be better off? Is it possible we have one of those Pareto efficient things? Now, obviously someone's worse off, right? Because anytime you cut costs, that was one of the great quotes from any medicine, anytime you cut Somebody's cost is somebody else's revenue. So there has to be a loser somewhere, but hopefully the loser is some, some person who's fraudulently taking advantage of the system. So I think we're getting close. So we'll definitely finish Thursday night and you should be able to finish your paper. So we should this weekend, y'all should be free to finish your paper, I would think. Now, should I show you a previous paper? So I'll probably turn the video off and do it so that I don't want people just copying someone else's paper. So I'll find I'll find a previous paper. You want one that's really, really good or one that's really, really bad? Really good one? Okay. 
you're going to find there's a lot of papers that this is the title of each of their sections. I have no trouble with that. If you want to do that, I don't count off of that. I'm not sure this order is the best order, but the advantage you have of that. So what I recommend students do is at least your first draft do that. And then you go back and edit and work it around. That way you make sure you covered everything. So it does make it easier for me to grade it. So All right. any questions on any of that? Have I at least given you enough full so you can be really makes some people really mad at Thanksgiving? And hopefully we'll do that. So y'all let me know. Again, your extra points. You have a great conversation at Thanksgiving. Put that into your paper. I will definitely count that as well. All right, I'll let you out. Um, so I do really like this book. He, they make some strong points. <clears throat> so their big thing is for consumers to take charge. So under consumerism, to make health, there's a great quote here, to make healthcare better and cheaper for all Americans, so better and cheaper, we must change the way we pay for medical services. You can already hear the anti-insurance part of their argument. If we, y'all have this book up, Right, see what I'm, which file I'm using? The healthcare book notes highlighted. Everybody have that open? I don't know, Blackboard. Maybe the last thing in the in the list of books or articles. If and when consumers take charge, the American healthcare system will quickly improve. Until then, it will not. I, I'm somewhat of a believer in that. That. If you can get the right incentives into a capitalist society, you really can change things faster. It can destroy things as well. Uh, Dr. Lowe from MIT, he uses 2008 as a proof of concept because he said, look at what finance did in 2008 on mortgages. They destroyed the whole world. That's how much power it has. Take all that power and redirect it in something good. You, if you can get the right incentives working with finance, and you can you can change things really quite rapidly, and so that's their argument. Obviously, this is Cato people, so they're they're somewhat libertarian. Then, inhabitants of this universe insist on identifying root cause causes. The two most central, of which are the intrusion of the political process and healthcare spending decisions, and the resulting over reliance on insurance and other forms of third party payment. I, I I'm coming to agree with both of those. The book I'm reading right now. Uh, Luke, I don't know if you got that book yet or not, but it's a pretty controversial book. They made a documentary out of it as well, so I had to go watch the documentary and see how it's doing. But it does put a lot of blame on the government, the government being in the hip pocket of, of pharma and hospitals. And so our government makes decisions in order to push as much money to the healthcare system as possible. It's somewhat of a cynical view, but there's, there, you can certainly make that argument. The incentives that result from these fundamental errors. So he said two errors. It's government, the political process, and insurance. It renders healthcare transactions actions op op opaque. These incentives enable and encourage healthcare providers for whom opacity, opacity is a boon to mistreat payments and overcharge consumers and taxpayers. Singapore as the model worthy of attention, that approach uses mandatory and tax advantaged personal health savings accounts to which the government could add funds when necessary. Patients have control over how these are spent and funds become part of the person's estate if unspent, moving in this direction which transforms the incentives that spend, send healthcare prices and quality in one direction. There's another 10%. What does Singapore do? How hard is that to Google? I might Google healthcare in Singapore. Would that be an easy way to do it? <laughs> you find all kinds of things that would come up. I, I don't know. I, 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 if I go to Asia, Singapore is probably the first place I'll go because I think you can get around with English in Singapore without too much trouble. Okay, then they expanded out the five big problems with the current system. Political control, he's already said that. Every time Congress wades into this, it winds up spending more healthcare, more money on healthcare. And that's absolutely the case. Insurance is the second one, 30 party payment. In 1960, we spent only 27 billion. Had healthcare spending grown at the same rate as general economy, it would have been about 220 billion in 2016, just under 7% of the figure that it actually was. 
in the early 1960s, pay, patients paid 1.8 out of every out of pocket for every one dollar spent. By the end of the decade, it was approximately one for one. Today, consumers contrib directly contribute less than 20 cents for every dollar shelled out by a third party payer. Yeah. Are they actually suggesting you could cut 97% or 93% out of healthcare? That's kind of what they imply there. But they're also implying we're not consumers. If you're only paying 20 cents every time you use the healthcare system, you, you're going to overconsume. Prices are too high. Over time, controls were added on the prices that provides, providers could charge, but there were no still no restrictions on volume. That gets back to what I said, governments control prices, not costs. And so if you control prices, you just increase volume. Medicare also has few quality controls. It pays doctors to deliver services that are unnecessary, unproven, even negligent. In 2014, the Department of Justice had one of its best years ever, making fraudsters cough up 3.3 billion. But that very same year, wrongdoers drained about 100 billion from the treasury by filing false Medicare and Medicaid claims. That'd be a good quote under fraud if you don't have enough under fraud yet. There's a lot in this particular one on fraud, no question. There's no good reason for this favorable tax treatment. Healthcare isn't intrinsically more important than food, housing, water, electricity, sanitation, transportation. Why are we so subsidizing this one industry? Quality, we already talked about quality. Quality is not job number one because providers are not paid to deliver outstanding care. They are paid to treat patients. I might put that under that quality issue. Why is quality so bad in healthcare where it should be the best quality is because no one has the incentive to fix that. They're actually paid to uh, harm patients. And they'll pay, pay city, they'll pay prices. No one knows what anything costs. So there's our five things. Just They said the first two are the most important, but there's some overlap with the first two and the others. Why are prices too high? Because they're very opaque. You're using the insurance system. So the people paying for it, aren't the ones actually using it. The political system encourages that. You know, it's it's all a big racket. It's really their argument. So what can we learn from their studies? Healthcare system is full of good people, but people, good people can't save a bad system when the incentives encourage bad acts. That could be a good quote to put under fraud. Hospitals literally make more money by treating patients for deadly infections than by preventing them. Hospitals can make more money by treating patients they have harmed than by preventing those harms in the first place. That can go in several places under the uh, the problem, I think. I don't know where you'd put that much. That's a pretty, I mean, it gets back to that one doctor in the movie. Doctors and hospitals have learned time and again that what is best for the patients is financially bad for them. There's another way. I and mean, this book is just full of great quotes. I, I was just like eating it up all the way through. It was, like, it was, a, it was a page turner. We can rescue ourselves from the mess we have created by helping people buy medical goods and services and health insurance directly the same way they buy other goods. That goes under that consumerism part under the solutions. I think we've seen that in other places. places. Patients who buy things with their own money, comparison shop. They look for high quality goods and services that are delivered conveniently at a reasonable cost. Again, consumerism. Providers may enjoy a local monopoly, but beleaguered patients can erupt, disrupt their cozy cartel by traveling elsewhere. By having heart surgery at a world-class hospital in India, an average American can save enough money to live on for a year. The average charge for knee replacement in the United States is $57,000, but the surgery center of Oklahoma, the operation is only $19,400 and it's probably $37 in India. Who knows? I mean, it's amazing what that one guy was doing. So shop around. So first thing, if you want to go to India, you can save, you can save 90%. If you don't leave the US, you can still save 50, 60, 70%. But what's the missing piece? Consumer knowledge. They don't know this. First of all, they don't care because they're not paying for it. But secondly, even if they're paying for it, they don't have this information. They can't make those decisions. So data is extremely important. And then we've seen this over and over again. Insurance for high, high severity, low frequency events. Insurers should pay for highly complex and expensive procedures that relatively few people need in any given years. Patients should pay for routine stuff. 
What's the one big problem here? Pregnancies, isn't it? Pregnancies is the one expensive elective surgery that, you know, if someone wants Botox, are you offended that they have to pay that out of pocket? It's like, oh, I can't believe these people have to pay for their own Botox insurance to cover that. But pregnancy is a little different. So that's one. I don't know what you do with that one. If you want to address that in your paper, I won't tell anybody what you say. You know, it's, there's no easy solution to that. I don't have a solution. I won't. It's not like I'm not telling you my solution. It's like I don't have one. Probably I'm just to be safe. I don't think about it because it's just too dangerous of an issue. Why does Medicare refuse to pay even though these alternatives are compared are a compared to bargain? Why doesn't Medicare say, hey, we're not going to pay for that surgery? There's other things that are much cheaper uh, because the program will only buy some, something for seniors if the money goes into the pockets of healthcare providers. If it's better, but it doesn't pay hospitals, Medicare won't touch it. One source reports that if all anti-property programs were replaced with a simple cash transfer at current spending levels, a poor family of four would receive an annual income of $70,000. Why are we doing it indirectly? Food stamps, housing, giving money to healthcare providers. Would the poor be better off if we just gave them $70,000 and say, hey, you do what you want with it. No food stamps, no housing, no Medi Medicaid. Would they be better off? And the argument is, yes, they would be because they spend it much more smartly. But instead we do it like this. But that's one argument. And that's definitely a libertarian argument. Just give them the money. And some countries have actually tried this. I don't know if you've read some of the experiments. Let's just hand them 100 bucks. And, and the studies have shown the money is spent much more wisely, much more intelligent. Why don't people want to do that? Oh, they're going to buy alcohol, they're going to buy cigarettes. They actually, they don't. Some do, but most don't. Most poor families don't want their kids to starve and get bad educations. And the overwhelming majority of want their families to do well. So you give them the money, they actually spend it want more wisely than government, but governments don't believe that. They think they're smarter. Very libertarian argument. A 2017 article similarly noted that prices for US made pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals have climbed over the past decade six times as fast as cost of goods and services overall. That is why it's dangerous to give drug companies monopolies. And that is why patients, and that is what patents do. Congress accepted $3.3 billion in campaign contributions from the pharmaceutical health care product sector. That is why reforms with real potential to bring down drug prices are never seriously proposed. There's one of my typos. Proposed at the federal level. I don't know if you put this on their fraud, but is it fraud that Congress is owned by this industry? They will not tackle this industry. That's what bothers me about Medicare for All with uh, Bernie Sanders. He's not talking about nationalizing health care. He's talking about nationalizing health insurance. But who's the culprit here? Is it insurance companies that are the problem? They may be part of the problem, but the problem is the providers of the care. If you nationalize Medicare so that everybody has all these dollars they can spend on this industry, the industry loves it. So, you know, I don't I don't know what he says of that. Now, Bernie Sanders actually has a really interesting solution to this. And you, you could read about that. He has he has proposed an alternative to patents. And I think this book actually talks about it. I don't think I have it in my notes, talks about it being a very interesting proposal. Uh, why can't you do pharmaceuticals? Yeah, they're going to spend billions for this patent. But. Are there other ways we can compensate them versus giving them monopoly? And that's that's his proposal. It's interesting. So he does think about this side, but um, I don't know. I'd be curious if one of y'all go onto his site and look at Medicare for All and then think, what is about his proposal that's going to bring down the cost of healthcare? So I think the only thing he's saying, we take all those profits from insurance companies, but that's not a... That's that's a piece, but it's not a massive part of the problem. The massive part of the problem, I think, is the providers. With Pfizer and Lilly matching in lockstep and Bayer, uh, LaVitra's manufacturer could have stolen the market by selling for less. It didn't. It matched the two move for move. Consumers might be willing to spend more, but that is irrelevant. So essentially what the pharmaceuticals say, they make an argument that no economists ever make. They say this consumer 
to this consumer, this drug's worth 50,000 bucks because we're saving their life. But no other market says this. What does every other market says? The marginal revenue on this product is X. That's what we charge. It's a competitive market. Markets don't charge what it's worth to the consumer. Markets charge their marginal cost. It's a competitive market. You don't buy a car based on what it's worth. You buy a car based on competition. You go buy a car that's worth so you should compete. So someone says, hey, you know, you got to spend $200,000 for this car because, man, if you had to walk to work, you couldn't make much money. You'd have to walk 10 hours a day. You, you'd lose your job. No, you should have to pay $500,000 for this car. I mean, just think about it. Take all your future incomes. I mean, is that logical? Is that a logical argument? You say, yeah, but I can buy a Volkswagen for $30,000. It's like, yeah, but it's worth more than that to you. You can't live your life without a car. It's just a ridiculous argument. But that's what the pharmaceuticals like to argue. The only way they could raise prices of home and market share was by acting in concert, and that is what they did. The fact that drugs were patented doesn't explain how they were able to match, march, and lockstep. So they're essentially arguing there's some collusion going on. This industry, this industry protects itself, keeps itself from competition. Drug makers are gaming the payment the patent system to generate additional profits on drugs that are already known to work. Yeah, um, they go quite into detail into this in their book. It's pretty amazing the tricks pharmaceuticals play to take a drug that's gone off a patent, should be generic, and then make a slight change so they get a whole new life for it. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, Yeah, the FDA granted them, warned all our manufacturers to stop shipping the, the drug. So they raised the price from 10 cents to $5. You know, the FDA is actually discouraging competition. The FDA's approval gave it exclusive rights to market the drug. They raised the price uh, from 300 to 29,000. The stock price went from $1.50 to 13. It would have cost 268 billion to, to buy this drug for all Americans infected with hepatitis C to put that number in perspective. In 2012, just two years earlier, Americans spent 261 billion on all prescription drugs combined. These drugs are insanely expensive. At $84,000 a piece, the cost of giving that to all of them would have exceeded the faculty's the facility's total budget. Many infected veterans were therefore denied curative treatment. Medicare is barred from negotiating prices. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. You might read some of these. They give a lot of examples. Um, but what does Gilead argue? It's still a good deal because it cures hepatitis C. Again, they're making an argument. That's what it should be worth to the customer. That's not the way business works. About half of the most transformative drugs invented in the last 25 years had their origins and research that was supported by public funds. So we're already paying for the development of these drugs, and then we're paying for them all over again when we buy the drug. The 72 cancer therapies approved these 12 years gave patients only 2.1 more months of life than older drugs, but 11 of 12 approved were priced above $100,000 per course. Research shows that a medication's price has no relationship to how well it works. So they are developing drugs that are slightly better and they're charging $100,000 for it. I mean, do you want your grandfather spending $100,000 for an extra 2.1 months of life? What's he gonna say? What do I care? I'm not paying for it. You're paying for it out of your taxes, but he's not paying for it. Um, yeah, he talks about contributions in here. Medicare beneficiaries, 20% co-payment exceeds the entire cost of the drug. In fact, Congress preventing Medicare and Medicaid from switching from uh, these uh, how much things cost to any arrangement would have brought payments more nearly into line with providers' actual costs. Congress repeatedly refused to act on bills that would have based payments on actual costs to make the drug. In every other industry, remember your economics, it's marginal costs. Price equals marginal costs, but not in this industry. Price equals what we think it's worth to you as a consumer. That's That'd be great business if you started. Um, yes, yeah, these 
you kind of get mad when you read some of these, but they're just great examples. So I don't, you can't put all of them in your paper. You might find one that's the most egregious. Uh, it sold for $2,300 a dose, 38 times as much as the alternative. Six randomized clinical trials that find that these two drugs were equivalent. Why do so many eye doctors use the more expensive drug? Medicare pays physicians a lot more for using the other drug. If you're wondering why Medicare is simply paying the same amount or require physicians to use a cheaper drug, their answer is that the law prevents the government from doing either. Whose money are we talking about here? It's not Medicare's money, is it? What's your grandfather father you're gonna say at Thanksgiving? I paid for that. I've been paying Medicare premiums. We'll talk about it here a little bit later. You can say, no, no, Grandpa, you, you didn't pay for this. I'm paying for this. This creates large incentives for cardiologists to implant stents. But I can tell you, after reading this book and a few others, they tell me I need stents. I'm going to go to like seven other doctors and ask uh, voice stents. Even when they are not necessary, according to Bloomberg News, two out of three elective stents are more than 200,000 procedures a year are unnecessary. The stents confer no benefit. The patients who receive stents weren't less likely to die or suffer non-fatal heart attacks, unplanned uh, issues uh, compared to those who only took medication. The financial cost of implementing stents in hundreds of thousands of patients who don't need them was $2.4 billion a year. That's just for the stents to calculate the total cost. You'd have to add in the millions upon millions of dollars spent on blood thinners and medical monitoring. Pretty incredible. Do y'all know people who had stents, don't you? They do it all the time. This is saying that two out of three times you don't you don't need it. Two RMC doc doctors perform unnecessary to be highly profitable cardiac procedures on over 750 patients. The surgeries were thought to have killed at least 94 patients who have caused and to cause many others to suffer strokes. So some doctors are operating on people who have no problems because they can charge all this money. That's criminal, obviously. But the system lets them get away with it because there's very little controls. Um, all right, this one's pretty hilarious. Um, do you know if y'all have doctor friends that you're going to see at Thanksgiving? Take this quote to them at the end of after dinner, right? Don't run the dinner. You're sitting there watching the Cowboys behind 32 to 7 because they always mess up at Thanksgiving. So everybody's mad anyway. So say, hey, Grandpa. So the researchers hypothesize that mortality, so these doctors, um, are going to this big meeting. And so people say, hey, this is a good time to test, test this because obviously all these doctors going to these meetings, more people are going to die because these doctors, you know, they have to use these, these lesser doctors. So the researchers hypothesized that mortality would be higher during the meeting and the difference in outcomes would be largest in the teaching hospitals because they're going the most, where a disproportionately larger fracture of the cardiologists would attend the meetings. To their surprise, patients suffering, patients suffering from heart failure or cardiac arrest who showed up at me, major teaching hospitals while the conventions were underway fared better than those who arrived on other dates. High race patients fared better when doctors at teaching hospitals were at meetings because, isn't this incredible? They received less care. So take this to your grandfather who just retired as a doctor. Say, so, hey, I just read this quote. Any of y'all have doc grandfathers a cardiologist? What would he respond to that? That's kind of scary, isn't it? What does that tell you? That they want to open you up. They don't want to open you up to heal you. They want to open you up because they, they think they're so good. They may think they're healing you, but they think they're so good and they make a lot more money doing it. That's that's just a freaky, freaky quote. A planned cesarean section is an especially efficient way to organize their work. C-sections are also significantly more profitable. 32% of deliveries are C-section, but the optimal rate is less than a third of that number. We saw that in an earlier article. When urologists have a financial stake in IMRT, the proportion of patients referred triples. When you pay doctors to tell people to do stuff, they tell people to do stuff. Um, oh, this, oh man, my word. Y'all need to read this book, and it's just chock full of this stuff. The drug came in 100 milligram vials. Each 25 dose produced 75 grams. So they need 25, but they came in 100. 
So they bought them and they threw out the 75. It billed Medicare for the 100. The more medic medicine they wasted, the more money it made. So there is a whistleblower com complaint. So it, it changed the rules. Under new rules, Medicare paid for a flat rate of $20, $230 for treatment. Guess what happened? They quickly switched to 25 milligram, milligram injections, thereby reducing the number of vials dispensed and eliminating waste. Again, just absolutely incredible. Uh, reading uh, stories about our, our justice system, I've come to the conclusion we're putting the wrong people in jail. I think I've told y'all that before. We should be putting these people in jail. <laughs> They're ripping us off left and right. Dallas's patients no longer had to worry about getting too much of this treatment. Instead, they had to worry about getting too little. So as Medicare changed the rules, doctors went from over-treating people to under-treating people. So instead of killing them for over-treating them, they say, let's treat them for under -kill for let's kill them by under-treating them because that's, hey, Medicare's, hey, it's, it's just insanity. This kind of that one quote again. You get you, you how many so many how many choices do you have on that one quote? I'm paid to harm my patients. A big problem with American healthcare system it, it pays providers well for doing things that don't actually help patients. Or the quote from the lady at the end of the movie it was just all over the place. Mm -hmm. Suffice studies showing that artificial surgery to correct this condition of the knee is no better than sham surgery. And it's much more expensive. Doctors perform the procedure on more than half a million Americans per year at a cost of $3 billion. So that's where I, I talk about evidentiary medicine is illegal in the US. Why is it illegal in the US? Because Congress is paid to make it illegal because the industry doesn't want it to be illegal. Do you think you as a patient should be told this? Back surgery doesn't really work. Knee surgery doesn't really work. But I'm recommending you go in for knee surgery. That's, that's the market we're going in when you're walking into or limping into. And there is a 49 to 50 chance that he will be treated unnecessarily for a cancer that was never a threat to his life. Lots of men die with prostate cancer. Relative you die of prostate cancer. PSA-based screening results in small or no reduction in prostate cancer-specific mortality and is associated with harms. Yeah, there's your overdiagnosis quote, if you haven't gotten one already. What I recommend in overdiagnosis, I think I mentioned this earlier, I would pick at least two, maybe three, where you go in a little more detail. And here's a good quote on PSA. Um, it may actually be harming more people in, in, versus saving lives. A review of 10 trials involved more 600,000 women, so there was no evidence suggesting effect of mammography screening on overall mortality. The problem is that early, less reliable studies spawn whole industries because doctors rush to perform the service, prescribe medications that they expect to help patients. So what happens is something comes out and people say, wow, that sounds really good, let's do it. They start doing it, it becomes a habit. Then the studies come along and say, hey, that's of no value, but we have this inertia going and you can't stop it. It's this big wave and doctors just in the habit of doing it and they feel guilty if they stop, plus they don't make as much money. When better research reverses the initial studies, shutting down the industry is hard because so many providers depend on it for their livelihood. Now what happens in other markets? They go out of business. In this market, they stay in business because Medicare keeps paying them. Oh, this is an incredible quote. Only a fraction of what physicians do is based on solid evidence from grade eight randomized controlled trials. The rest is based and set on weak or no evidence on subjective judgment. Man, the book I'm reading right now, oh man, the things he's saying, if it's true, um, boy, it just makes you incredibly upset. Um, those that have their hands in the till, their studies are not randomized or not precise. Those who don't have their hands in the till, they have really good studies, but the FDA says, no, we can't accept that because you didn't do this. It's, it's, if, this if this book is true, it's, it's really freaky, freaky how the FDA um, rewards those that reward them and essentially destroys those 
who finds uh, cheap, simple solutions that don't make the industry money. I mean, it's, this book is pretty incredible. Here's, I'm sorry I couldn't get this. Uh, this chart could go in your paper, but that's about as good as I can do it. But you could probably recreate this yourself, couldn't you? You have, a, you, I, th I think it goes from highest percentage to lowest, lowest. So 50% uh, treatments and randomized control trials, 50% are effective, likely to be, I don't know. I'm not, I'm really not sure which direction it goes. Effectiveness of 3,000, yeah, my word. I wish I had better colors here. Can y'all tell? That's too dark to be the. It's like it starts at 11%. And you look at so that's 11. So beneficial, likely being beneficial. That is the right. Trade-off between benefits and harm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, good, good catch. Unlikely to be beneficial, likely to be ineffective or harmful, unknown. Yeah, I agree. So y'all might write that. So you might write it on the side, 11, 24, and just write it down. Yeah, that would be a great chart. You should take this to your doctor. Oh, you need a stent? Yeah. Where do stents fall in here? I want to know before you stick that in my body. That's what I should have asked my EMT. Where does the surgery fall in on this, this grid? Um, so what happens when the data comes out? When this group who found that they don't work, they actually cause more harm than good. They recommend it against PSA screening. The urologist protests and refuse to abide by any guidelines. The reaction was predictable. PSA testing is a $30 billion industry. How could a medical device so well accepted without any evidence be so well accepted without any evidence? We offer three reasons. First, doctors had a theory suggesting that it would work. Second, once the practice gained a following, doctors simply assumed that there was evidence. Third, Medicare, Medicaid, and others paid for it. Now, is this, are these people evil? They just don't believe the research? You know, what's going on here? I mean, do you think the urologist is going, yeah, I know it's no good, but I'm making money on it? Or do you think they're rationalizing to themselves, oh, that study's flawed, I know this stuff works, I know I'm saying, you know, what's going on in these people's minds? I see the same thing in the financial services industry. We're doing stuff that is harming our customers, but I think deep down we're rationalizing it. And those people selling those equity linked annuities, they probably think they're doing a customer something good. Um, what about mammograms? The guideline reflected their assessment of the evidence that for normal women in this age group, the expected health benefits of frequent mammograms are so small and the expected health costs so large that the procedure would probably do more harm than good. The balance tilted negative because mammograms generated false positive findings, which caused women to undergo unnecessary treatment. Prominent doctors piled on. Time Magazine quoted Dr. Dershaw, the director of breast imaging, as saying that he was appalled and horrified. There is no doubt that mammography screening in women saves lives. And he's right. It does save lives. It also kills people. <laughs> so that's not the point. It saves lives, but it also kills people. To recommend that women abandon this is absolutely horrifying to me. Is he evil or is he rationalizing what's going on here? Shouldn't he say, show me the data, I want to see the data? Shouldn't that be part of his culture? Shouldn't that be what all doctors would want? But where does he work? He works at a place and makes money on doing this. Stuff. So that's an incentive. Well, I think I skipped pretty fast here after this. Um, all right, pharma donated. They're, they're the huge donators. The pharma sector donated 3.3 billion the congressional campaigns, 43% more than the second largest contributing industry. Hospitals and nursing homes contributed 1.4 billion. Physicians, another 1.2 billion. That's $735,000 per legislator per year. What does Congress get paid? Got to be pretty low, right? Because AAC, AOC was talking about how hard it was to, to live off of her salary. 174000 What do you say about an industry where you pay people 174000 but the kickbacks are $735,000? Do you think they have any influence on these industries, on these Congress people? It's incredible. 
there's one quote, I don't think I have it highlighted, but um, Congress passed this rule that was going to really harm the healthcare industry. And they got so many lobbyists that Congress said, well, we'll delay it one year. And so they got all these contributions. And then they said, hey, you know what? Why don't we get a lot of contributions next year by people telling us, why don't you delay it one more year? And they say, hey, this is pretty cool. Why don't we every year get contributions to ask us to delay it one more year? We've got this cash cow. And they, they started playing the system. Instead of killing the bill, they just kept delaying it one year and they kept getting all these contributions. Hey, why don't y'all put that legislation in another year? Okay, yeah, we can do that. You know, send me $735,000. We can maybe work that out. Um, so lobbyist group, physicians need a new fix. Well, there it is right there. So yeah, I should have kept reading. So here's under waste. You have that se section waste and fraud. The numbers are all over the place. So 30% you see a lot of waste. So what they're saying is we could cut 30% out and our health would be no worse than it is right now. We'd be in the exact same health we are. With total spending now 3 trillion, we're spending a trillion dollars unnecessarily. That's more than we spend, that's $400 billion we spend on national defense. We could reduce Medicare spending by 50% without doing damage to our collective health. Health policy experts know that we see at best only weak aggregate relations between health and medicine. In contrast, apparently strong aggregate relations between health and many other factors such as exercise, diet, sleep, smoking, pollution, climate. This sounds like the second article, doesn't it? We find a better way to spend that $1.7 million. Cutting half of medical spending could, would seem to cost little in health and yet would free up vast resources to make us healthier. I don't know where that goes, probably on the waste. Remember on the waste and fraud, I talked about incentives. So, you know, but could we spend this money better? Or maybe this is in your final, final conclusion. Almost 100 seniors a day die from medical procedures they didn't need and shouldn't have received. I don't know why I put this in here. Yeah, I don't remember why I put that in there, but anyway, it's in there. If I put a picture like that in there, it must have been good because it was a real pain for me to take a picture and put it into the thing. So I, it must have been important, but I don't remember. Um, doctors can pick the codes they want. Not surprisingly, thousands pick the code that generate the highest payments. That gets back to the old, you know, if I don't have the rubric up, but if I pull the rubric up, it's that opaque, opaque nature. I can't remember where I put it in here, but yeah, I guess it's there. And the complexity of a system, this opacity, opaque bills. I don't know how to spell opaque. I just saw it, but I don't remember how to spell it. But something like that. We don't know what we're paying for. I think that goes under that section, the complexity of the system, lack of price transparency. I, I think that's lack of price transparency, the same thing. So you can't, you don't know if your doctor misbilled you because you don't know what anything on the, the bill is. They told healthy patients they had cancer so we could make money by giving them chemo care, chemotherapy, chemo care, chemotherapy they didn't need. Reportedly gave one of his patients 155 chemo treatments over two and a half years, even though the patient was cancer free. So you say, well, that's, that's criminal. But the system is set up to reward criminals, and that's why they're in this system because they can take advantage of the system and get away with it. So it's part of it's you know that's, that's the tell of the when you have a really bad system, that's what's going to happen. You're going to have that kind of excessive um, surprise bills. When providers are out of network, they can pay patients at their own vast inflated prices. The patient is responsible for the difference because the doctor, being out of network, never agreed to accept accept. Sorry, ensures this kind of rates balance billing for out of network treatment is a scam. We saw that earlier. And I talked about this earlier. Anesthesiologists were the worst. 
He received $117,000 a prize bill from an assistant surgeon he hadn't known about or met. When's the last time you paid someone $117,000 and you've never met them in your life? The bill was 20 to 40 times the usual local rate and orders of magnitude larger than the fee charged by the private. So he paid this surgeon he hadn't met, didn't know what he's doing, paid him $117,000. The doctor who actually did everything, he paid $6,200. Two plastic surgeons charge more than $250,000 to show up, show up for his decision. Something that a resident could have done. So some are trying to solve the problem. You all, if you're gonna, if you're gonna work at our hospital, you have to be part of our network. So here's something else you can do your 10% on. So there was a bill in front of Congress to eliminate surprise bills. I think I talked about in a previous article. So you might look at that, but there are exceptions such as ambulance services. This is a great, this is something great to put under that section on the surprise bill. Surprise bills are a consequence of a lack of market competition. I have seen this for like plumbers, and other industries, car mechanics, y'all probably seen those, you know, the kind of undercover. I saw it for a rental car agency. So there is some of that out there. Um, and it's just because, you know, a lot of that's because we don't know much about plumbing or with rental cars. You know, you're not going to do a whole lot of research. You show up and they end up charging you 200 extra dollars for something. So, but healthcare, it's, it's pretty normal. Um, Yeah, yeah, I don't want to highlight that one. <clears throat> Medicare's fraud related losses may run as high as 30 to 35% of its budget. There's a good waste quote. Medicare and Medicaid receive something like 3 billion claims. Now, this, so why doesn't Medicare do more? They re receive 3 billion claims per year for a human being to spend five minutes require 125,000 people working 2,000 hours. So obviously the computer's gonna be doing most of the work here and the computer's gonna do a lot to try to catch things, but the, the workload, the volume is just way too massive for them to be able to really do any kind of monitoring. Healthcare providers, and so what do we want to have happen? We don't want Medicare and Medicaid doing the monitoring. Whom do we want to do the monitoring? The patient. Right, the patients there, they're asking the questions. We want them to be doing all of that and getting a good price, getting good quality. We don't want Medicare to be doing a billion of those. Healthcare providers that harm patients can make more by doing so. They get paid once for delivering services, second time for treating the injuries they inflicted. This may explain why health providers harm patients so often. A large body of evidence gathered in recent years has revealed a profound failure by healthcare professionals to follow basic steps proven to stop infection. We know that hundreds of thousands of Americans suffer, suffer serious complications or die as a result. That patients at the worst American ho hospitals were three times more likely to die and 13 times more likely to have medical complications than if they visit, and visit the best ho hospitals. It seems likely the few hospitals know where they that, that the few hospitals know where they stand. They simply can't make money on, by measuring or improving quality. Our politically controlled third-party payer system has taken away any business case for improving quality. So I, I when I read this, my first thought is if I'm gonna go in for major surgery, I gotta have more time to do research. But if you're going in for major, it's like my friend who's doing chemo. They say, hey, you're stage four. You need to go in right now. You don't have weeks to do research. And you say, well, you should have researched in, research in advance, but he just found out right then. So it's a big problem here. So someone else is going to have to help us. We need to be able to click on the internet. Who is the best cancer, you know, chemo hospital in, in the country? Oh, it's in, uh, in Tennessee. Okay, I'm going to go to Tennessee. I'm going to get a hotel room. That's what we need, but you don't have that kind of, you don't have the data to be able to do that at your fingertips. So what did he do? He goes wherever the doctor sends without any research. Who knows if you're getting, he may get into worst care in the entire country. And afterwards, what are you going to say? What do all your friends say? I've got the best doctor out there. And what do you ask them? How do you know? You don't know. You're just hoping you do. So you say it makes you, makes you feel good, but we don't know. We're hoping you have the best doctors. I hope they didn't cause this damage. 
the connection between price and quality is far weaker. Indeed, it can be inverted. The better providers charging less and then the inferior ones, patients don't know this. So we're using price as a thick signal and price is not a good signal. The most expensive doctors may be the worst doctors. I'm not gonna read through that. There's another chart that might be good. So you might look at some of these. I don't remember what that was. The less we rely on ourselves, the more we spend in relation to your direct financial responsibility for medical ex ex expenditures and per capita healthcare spending. All right, this goes back to what we saw earlier. When we paid more out of pocket, uh, we spent less per capita. When we spend less out of pocket, we spend more. And in some of these, I, I underline the, the source. So you might actually go to the source and see if there's something there. That's an awfully long website. All right, let me do the grain going forward so we can finish out here. A typical one, or, okay. Uh, all right, so here's how you're gonna make everybody mad at Thanksgiving. So you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Everybody's happy. You're, everybody's gonna leave in about two hours. Oh, by the way, I'm in this insurance class. A typical one earner couple, couple can expect to receive Medicare benefits worth $424,000 after paying in $70,000. A two earner couple fares slightly worse. They get $425,000 benefits and they paid in $102,000 in Medicare taxes. A still bonus. Part B premiums now cover only 25% of spending on physician services. 75% is an untaxed gift of the program's beneficiaries. Um, yeah, George W. Bush, he said, hey, I got this wonderful benefit for seniors. He forgot to say, I got this wonderful benefit for pharmaceuticals. He didn't say that part of it. Um, yeah, we're not paying enough. So when you're when your great uncles say, hey, I paid into Medicare, you can say, well, you paid in a third of what you should. I'm paying the other two thirds, so the three fourths out of my pocket. And then run, you know, leave. We gotta go home now. I'm gonna get back. But anyway. And why is it like that? Because governments love to give stuff away and they hate taxing people. So it's really easy to do because it's somebody else's problem 10 years from now. So why not? If you're a politician, why not give people $420,000? $27,000 of benefits when they only paid in $70,000. Their grandkids can pay for it. Proponents of all Medicare for all three. So here's their argument. Um, so this is the argument you're here and you can see what Bernie Sanders says. Well, Medicare has so little administrative costs. When it actually reflects the government's staggering delivery, three, I can't say that word, with taxpayers' money. In 2005, Medicare administration costs were $500 per primary beneficiary compared to private sector of $453. Just I ask why Medicare doesn't bargain over prices already. The program spends more than $630 billion a year, so its financial clout with doctors, hospitals, and drug companies is enormous. But throughout its entire existence, Medicare has been a price taker. It has never bargained over prices. Congress forbids it. Medicare is actually more expensive than its budget shows, mainly because Medicare doesn't have to do cash collection. It lets the IRS do that for them. It lets the employees, employers do that for them. They got a lot of government agencies doing a lot of the work for them. Uh, so they're actually more expensive than their books show. But I think the biggest thing with Medicare is their fraud prevention is so weak. They're paying so much out that they shouldn't be paying out. And that's costing us much more than this, any savings we may be getting from their administration. So yeah, we don't. They don't make a profit. They don't. They don't have CEOs making three hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand a year. History provides no basis for believing that the government will ever improve quality, reduce spending, or get fraud, waste, and abuse under control. Yet Medicare for all proponents persist in thinking that the government will magically run an enormous single payer program better than has run what it's doing right now. The U.S. government appears to be unusually subject to pressures from special interests. So I wish Bernie Sanders were here, don't y'all? It'd be pretty interesting. He'd obviously kill me in the debate, but he's not here, so I win the debate. Uh, but you do have to figure out if Medicare is wasting 30 something percent, why will Medicare for all suddenly solve that problem? What does he have in his plan? So go look at his plan and see how does he address 
that side of it. How does Medicare from all prevent doctors, pharmaceuticals overcharging when they're sending several hundred thousand dollars to politicians to make the laws that you know benefit the industry? Yeah, we talked about this before. Why is LASIK cost coming down when everything else isn't? Because LASIK is generally not covered by insurance. Um, so you can read some of these other quotes. I think I'm getting so. Read the other highlights. You can probably find some other stuff. Um, here's one on on the world. Hysterectomy costs thirty two thousand in the United States, four thousand in Thailand. Kidney transplant transplant one hundred fifty thousand dollars here, twenty five thousand in the Philippines. An American couple can expect to spend two hundred twenty thousand for a round of vitro fertilization in vitro fertilization, but in Israel, only $3,500. They offer services that are as good or better than those in the US in the American. So the very end on the solutions is medical tourism. So here's some quotes you can put that. Y'all see where the medical tourism is on the um, right there, lower cost, line 42. Lower cost models, medical tourism. Lower cost models, it's clinics, it's nurse practitioners. It's finding ways to do just as good with less expensive. You don't always need a fully trained physician to do things. Nurses can do a lot of things as well as doctors for a lot lower cost. But medical tourism. Uh, Clement Clinic charges 100,000 for this surgery, $1,600 in India. Their mortality rates are with are comparable are better than those. A 1.27% mortality rate, 1% infection rate compared to 1.2 and 1% in the United States. In a competitive market, that won't exist, will it? If you know there's a product out there for $1,600, it's just as good as a $100,000 product. What happens to the $100,000 company? They go out of business pretty fast, except for in medical care. <laughs> But I, I would bring this into the, the medical tourism. I think that's a pretty powerful quote. Here's some. Here's a good chart. You might find that I messed it up with underlying it, but if you can somehow get that in, uh, just comparing uh, costs in the U.S. versus other countries, it's pretty amazing. But Americans prefer to travel domestically, but you can still save a lot of money by going around the country. Here's something you also can re research, these websites. Try that Smart Shopper Network gives a list of providers and network and rates them on basis of quality. See if there's anything there. It then provides cash incentives to lower, to use lower cost providers. So again, this is a great solution here. Um, I have it in here under, Uh, I mean, you can kind of put it information on quality, per process improvements, um, tech, using tech. I think this is using tech, using tech so you can compare prices and services. You might go out and see what they have. What if your insurance company told you you need this test, go get the test. But if you if you drive 10 miles more, we'll pay you 50 bucks. Would that be enough incentive? Because you go 10 miles more, they only charge 100 bucks versus the nearest one charges 500. You go the extra 10 miles, we'll pay you 50 bucks. Might be worth it. That's what this firm does. They work with insurance companies, they work with clients, and they say, hey, we've, we've done the research. It's a lot cheaper to go there. You don't care because you're not paying for it, but hey, we'll pay you 50 bucks. You go there, your insurance company will, will save money. They'll pay us. That's a pretty cool business, I think. I don't know if it's operating in San Antonio, but you might look it up. So you might Google that and see if they're providing services. I, I think I tried some time ago and it wasn't in San Antonio at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Y'all can read that one on your own. Yeah, fraud and abuse. Yeah, that we've already seen that. Uh, I don't wanna cover those. Okay, some of this you can just read on your own. I don't, Affordable Care Act, I'm not really into that much. All right, so what do they require? We need insurance for catastrophic coverage. 
out of pocket or that are expected and predictable and a welfare program. That's almost exactly the same as the first article, isn't it? Almost exactly word for word, the same relationship. Then they're both libertarian, so it kind of makes sense. Um, the ratio of federal budget, federal benefits to the old versus the young is roughly three to one based on wealth. The ratio of one to three, this you can bring up with your grandparents. When your grandfather says senior citizens shouldn't be paying property taxes, and say, okay, grandpa, we're already subsidizing you three to one. And based on your wealth versus my wealth, you should be paying three to one. So stop complaining. Eat your eat your mac, mac and cheese or whatever. But it's this is the argument they make. Why do they make this argument? Why does your grandfather who has you know 2.3 million sitting in his savings account? Why is he upset that he has to pay property taxes? Because old people are old, they shouldn't have to pay anything. You're going to pay for it. It's going to come out of your pocket because there's no one left. Your grandfather's going to die way before he's going to have to pay for it. So here's Singapore again. So you might read through theirs, their plan. Um, there's again, if you're going to do Medicare for all, read some of these quotes. Do a search on this book on the word Medicare. Make sure you're covering these debates because it's it's pretty important that you understand Medicare is not this perfect system. Yeah, senior citizens love it. It gets really high, good mark, really good marks. But I'm talking about the financial side of it. How it's getting paid for? It's is it financially um, viable? Um, okay, so Main Street health policy thinkers assess access to me medical service matters more than other goods and services that, that, that affect people's well-being. First, healthcare does not equal well-being, but it's only one of the many, many things. Medicare pol Medicaid policy is fundamentally paternalistic. If the program were actually devoted to well-being, it would hand out cash. We saw that earlier and let people spend it. What do you think the poor in this country would say? Food stamps, Medicaid, housing allowances, or we give you 70,000. If you were to vote, have them vote, what do you think they would say? Now, some people say, you, you can't, you're not gonna give them housing. They have to go out and find their own housing. Have you looked for a house in San Francisco lately? What do you think they would vote? Any guesses? How many think they would go for the 70,000? Anybody? One or two? So you think most of them say stick with what we have? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Maybe go out and ask them. I mean, it's kind of hard to say, hey, you look poor, I can ask you a question. That might not work so well, but you know, I'd be curious. I would rather have the money, but I might sit down and do some calculations first to try to see. I think I could spend my, my food budget better because I might then be $200 of food stamps. I might only need $150 for food. I may be able to, you know, I might be able to spread my, my food budget much better than somebody else. I might rather have that $50 for something else. Who knows? I can make better decisions. Uh, the, they did not find that people who cut back. On, so here's the thing Congress says. We can't do that because they won't get the good, they won't get the medical care they need. They're going to cut back and it's going to harm them. What they find is that when people cut back a medical treatment, um, they were not less healthy than those who got everything that was ordered. They found that even though people who were treated for free used more medical treatments, their health was effectively the same as those who, who had to pay. Why is that? Because you give rich people, you give middle-class people, you give poor people money and make them make decisions, they actually make intelligent decisions. It encourages people to use the effect services more and the people services they get are more likely to harm them than actually help them in many cases. When hundreds of millions of people spend their own money in healthcare, they will behave differently and healthcare providers will too. Oh, that's a great quote under consumerism. I love that quote under consumerism. It really tells you, it doesn't just change the patient, the healthcare industry will change to make those patients uh, get the right kind of services. All right. I love, y'all see why I love this book. I, I could have just done this, but, but I didn't. I remember, and 
in college, I had a health a history class. I bought this book used, and whoever had it had highlighted the entire book. It's like that's kind of a waste. <laughs> Every single line was highlighted. It's like, man, how many highlighting pins did he buy? So a lot of stuff there. One last thing to cover, and then we're done with healthcare, and that's taxes. So what I want you to think about taxes, you've got the employer. the employee, and you have government in taxes. And let's just say government budget. That'd be the best way to talk about it. So, the, so um, today, they pay, let's say, 15,000 in health care benefits. They get a tax deduction. The employee gets health care. No tax paid on that contribution. The government loses tax revenue. So let's move to one solution, I'm going to say it's a great solution. They pay 15,000 in salary. They get a tax deduction. So the employer, what do they care? I would say they're happier. Why are they happier? I might argue they save money. Why might they save money? Do you think they have people hired to do nothing but administer their health care program? More than like, I know USA had a health, health insurance actuary working for them. Not in their insurance business, but in their human resources. They hired an actuary. Actuaries are not cheap. This is a really good actuary. I'm sure he was making a very good salary. Mm -hmm. So they may actually be a little bit off. What does the employee get? They get higher pay. But lose their health insurance. <clears throat> you have to pay tax in the 15000 But they can contribute, say, 5000 to MSA. So they pay tax on 10000 and have an MSA. The MSA they can use for paying health care. And then they buy, let's say, fifteen hundred dollar high deductible policy, and they get fifteen hundred dollar tax credit. So they they're a little bit worse off. Why? Because they have to pay tax. So how much do they have to pay tax? What's well, kind of interesting here, because. They're going to pay, say, $2,000 tax here, but they're going to get $1,500 back on a tax policy. And so now they have health care. But they bought it themselves, but they didn't really because they got a tax credit. All right. So it, it's kind of complex. It's going to depend each individual on what their marginal tax rate is, how much their health insurance is. But I'm going to argue that the health insurance is going to be really cheap for two reasons. Number one, it's a high deductible policy. Number two, everybody's going to buy insurance because you get the tax credit. You're stupid not to buy it. So you take care of the pre existing. Not an issue because everybody's going to buy insurance. So they're, they may be worse off, better off. It really depends on that tax credit versus the 10,000. But the big thing is they decide how to spend their money. So the economists will say they're gonna be happier because they're gonna decide how to spend that $15,000 versus their employer. Right now they have no choice. You work for a company, your employer is making that decision. Now you're buying your insurance, you're putting 5,000 away to help cover that deductible. 
your insurance is really cheap because you're only paying for high frequency, high severity events. You have health care, or how I'll say you say you have health insurance would be the better way to say that. I should have said that up here above. And I'm going to argue that you could do this so that the government is neutral on taxes. I really think you could do that. So I, I think you can do it so the employer is much happier. The employee, it's going to depend. There's going to be some winners and losers, but I think they're going to be happier because they have more control over their own money. And I think the government's better off. So if I were a politician, I would really be focusing in on this part of the equation, trying to make that neutral, trying to make that neutral, getting the employers out of the health insurance game entirely. It's a waste, I think, for them to even be there. So if I were an employee, I'd be focused right here. How can we get this so that we can get consumers in better shape? And what is our ultimate goal? Unlock consumerism. Oh, here. So what is that going to do? It's going to reduce this cost. It's going to reduce the need of that. Once we get consumerism in the healthcare, healthcare costs are going to come down. So these two lines are going to get cheaper over time, and that's our ultimate goal. So maybe initially the average consumer is going to be a few hundred dollars worse off, some better off, some worse off. The biggest losers are the wealthy. People with the highest tax rate will be. So unfortunately, this penalizes the wealthy. So sorry about that. So we have, you know, AOC will like this approach, maybe. So yeah, the higher your marginal tax rate, the worse off you are. The poor would really do extremely well in this particular one. The poorer you are, the better off you do. And I, I do believe you could do it, but I don't have the math to prove it to you. I tried it once and it's just way too complicated, but that's what I'm after. If you'd like a solution like this, you don't have to make it perfect, but that's what you're, you're dealing with. You're dealing with a very complicated formula. Why is this insurance so expensive? Because it pays for everything. Everything you do, doctor visits, it's paid for. Why is this so cheap? Because it doesn't pay for much. 90% of people won't have, won't pay for anything. They may pay stuff out of here, doctor visits, those kind of things, but they, they'll hardly ever use their insurance, which is what we want. We don't want insurance used very often at all. They'll be using that the most. And so that's why that's so cheap. Very low frequency, very high, high severity. Or some of y'all might say, forget, forget that. Remember the second article? Government for hundred thousand dollar cats, right? Remember he said that. So you bring the government in just for those massive cats. The government can handle that because it's not, you know, it's very infrequent. And then with, I guess you call them death panels. I can't think of a good term for that. But you say we're not covering that. Sorry, we're not going to spend five million dollars for someone who is who is brain dead. And sorry, it just it sounds sad. We're going to do that. Y'all know what cats are, right? Catastrophes. Not $100,000 cats, but catastrophes. So however you want to talk about it, but or you can do Medicare for all, but if you're going to Medicare all, you're going to have to really dig into it a lot. Questions on this? Don't y'all wish I had the numbers? Don't you wish someone had the numbers? Wouldn't it be really fascinating to see, get into the details on this? I'd love to be an economist and this be my project. And sit down and say, hey, can we figure out something? Everybody's... But most people are better off. Okay, the wealthy won't be better off. They're the biggest beneficiaries of this. But let's see if we can get 80% of Americans better off, employers are better off, and the government's no worse off. We can do that. I think we got a pretty good system. So wealthy are worse off. Hospitals, pharmaceuticals are worse off. But the American consumer is better off. All right. And y'all, write your paper this weekend. So if you've been paying attention in class, you can probably at this point write the entire paper off the top of your head other than that 10% research thing you got to do. As you got your quotes in place, you just got to put your comments around them. Isn't that true? Isn't that where we are at this point? So it shouldn't be that difficult a paper to write. 
if you're not sure on any of these things, look over this weekend and next, next Tuesday, I can help flesh out some of these things if you're not sure. So I, I think I've gotten you ready. All right, let's stop it there. Next, next class, we'll definitely start the pricing of insurance. So bring a calculator, we'll start doing the math stuff.